Welcome to the fourth video lecture of the Lithography Tool Package Training at DTU Nanolab. This lecture is a more detailed look into the development process. After the exposure step, the resist now has a latent image of the mask pattern. The procedure for bringing out this latent image is called development. It is done by submerging the resist in a chemical solution which etches the resist. Some parts of the resist is removed quickly, while other parts are removed very slowly. This is how the latent image is made to appear. In a positive tone resist, it is the exposed parts which are removed, and in a negative tone resist it is the unexposed parts that are removed. Photoresists are typically developed using aqueous alkaline solutions. Two very commonly used chemicals are TMAH and sodium hydroxide. E-beam resists are typically developed using solvents. A commonly used solvent is pentyl acetate. The resist is submerged in the development chemical, which removes the unwanted parts of the resist. We are left with a substrate that now has a resist pattern matching the photo mask. At DTU Nanolab we have two methods available for development. The first method is submersion development. With this method the entire substrate is submerged into a container filled with the development solution. This method is very simple and is used whenever manual development is required. The second method is puddle development. With this method a small puddle of chemical is made on top of the substrate. The puddle covers the entire surface of the substrate and is held in place by surface tension. This method is typically done in automated development tools. Submersion development can be good for fast batch processing since an entire wafer carrier with 25 wafers can be submerged all at once. It is also good for development of non-standard substrates, as most automated tools require standard substrates, which can be handled by the tool. Submersion development is also easy to do manually in a fume hood using glass beakers. One of the main downsides of submersion development is that the chemicals must be handled manually, which has increased safety requirements for the user. It also requires that the user manually cleans all the equipment after the process is complete. Process-wise there is the downside that the development solution becomes increasingly contaminated as more and more substrates are developed. The photo speed may also change over time, either due to the active component in the developer solution being consumed, or due to reaction with atmosphere or water vapor. Any advanced type of development also has to be done manually. This could include agitation of the substrate or substrate baking. While puddle development can be done manually, it is almost always done in an automated tool. Using a dedicated development tool means that there is no chemical handling by the user, which greatly increases the handling safety. In automated tools there is also no cleaning after the process is complete. Process-wise one of the main benefits of the puddle development is that every single development is done with fresh developer solution. This means that the process inherently becomes more stable and repeatable. It also means that there will be much less contamination issues. Automatic processing can also make it easier to do advanced development, since it is just programmed into the development recipe done by the tool. One of the downsides of the puddle development is that it is a serial process. Only one wafer is processed at a time, which can make it a lot slower to develop an entire carrier full of wafers, compared with the submersion development. Automated tools are also typically quite restrictive with the type of substrates they can accept, some can process chips while others cannot. They are also complicated machines with many failure points. At DTU Nanolab we have three standard developer solutions available. Alkaline developers for most photo resist. Solvent developer for a few photo resists. Solvent developer for e-beam resist. We have two aqueous alkaline developers. The most used of these is TMAH. This developer is used in our automatic developer tools, as well as our manual developer tool. It is also used for manual beaker development. The second alkaline standard developer we have is sodium hydroxide, but this can only be used for manual beaker development. 
The solvent developer for Photoresist is PGMEA. This developer is only used for development of SU8 resists. The solvent developer for E-beam resists is pentyl acetate. This solvent is known for its very distinct banana-like smell. TMAH is an abbreviation for tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. Besides being a corrosive base, it is also considered highly toxic, as it interferes with neurotransmitters in the body. It is important to know that skin exposure to an area of approximately 10 by 10 centimeters must be treated as a life-threatening event. However, it is also important not to panic. In the clean room we handle potentially dangerous tools, gases, and liquids every day. And we do it safely. Remember to respect and use your safety training. Remember that each tool has specific safety guidelines. And finally remember to behave properly in the clean room. Proper behavior is the tool you have for keeping yourself and those around you safe. An established process generally does not encounter a lot of development problems, but during the process development phase, it sometimes occurs that the development time is either too short or too long. When the development time is too short, we say that the resist is under developed. If we compare this image of a perfectly developed resist with this image of an underdeveloped resist, it is quite obvious that something is wrong. The resist film is not fully removed in the exposed areas, leaving behind a thin resist film where there should be none. This is almost always displayed in a quite colorful manner, as can be seen in this example, where the orange and blue colors are residual resist film which should have been removed. The actual color of the residual resist is determined by the thickness of the film. Any structure in the resist will most often have the correct dimensions, as the parts of the resist that was removed actually leaves behind the correct pattern. It is only the thickness that was incorrectly developed. When the development time is too long, we say that the resist is over developed. In this scenario, the pattern in the resist no longer has the correct dimensions, as the developer etches more than it was supposed to. Holes tend to become bigger and structures tend to become smaller. Very small structures can sometimes completely disappear. The resist film itself also becomes thinner, as it is more aggressively etched. This process of removing unexposed resist is known as dark erosion. Some resists require an additional baking step after the exposure. This baking step is called post-exposure bake or image reversal bake, depending on the exact process taking place. Some resists use thermal amplification of the exposure to cross-link the polymers in the resist. An example is AZ NLOF 2020. If the PEB is forgotten, then all the resist will be removed during the following development step. Other resists use the PEB to average out the wave intensity profile of the exposure light. An example is AZ MIR 701. If the PEB is missing, the development may still work, but the final result will have a reduced sidewall quality in the resist pattern. It could also appear to be underexposed. Finally, some resists are capable of changing between positive tone and negative tone by baking it after the exposure. This is called an image reversal bake. An example is AZ5214E. Forgetting the reversal bake means that the exposed pattern will not be inverted. The development will still work, but the result will be the original non inverted pattern. Development can be done manually in beakers in fume hoods. We have manual puddle tools and automatic puddle tools for E-beam and UV resists. We have a manual submersion tool for SU8 development. The manual beaker development is the development method which requires most work by the user. You start by finding all the necessary equipment and set it up in a fume hood. Before you pour any chemicals at all, you must write a chemical identification note. This note must always be next to your beakers and you are not allowed to remove it before you have discarded your chemicals after the process is finished. Then you can pour your developer and rinse agent into the beakers and set the timer. As soon as you submerge your substrate into the developer, you start the timer. When the timer ends, you immediately transfer the substrate into the rinse bath. This stops the development process. 
rinse the substrate properly. Discard the developer into the appropriate waste. Solvents goes into the sea waste drain, but TMAH goes into the dedicated TMAH waste can. This is quite important. If you remember your basic chemistry, you can never mix solvents with acids or bases. Finally, you must properly rinse all the tools you used, as well as clean up the fume hood. Our manual puddle developer tools are actually semi-automatic tools, but they can only process a single substrate at a time. We have two manual developers, one for development using TMAH and one for development of E-beam resists. These tools can process chips and wafers from 50 to 150 mm in diameter. The E-beam developer can also process 200 mm wafers. You use them by first placing your substrate on the chuck, then close the lid and safety door. Then you select the process you want to run and press start. When the process completes, the substrate has been cleaned and is ready to be removed from the tool. Our two automatic developer tools also only process a single wafer at a time, but can process an entire wafer carrier automatically. Both tools use TMAH as developer. They can only process whole wafers from 100 to 200 mm diameter. You place your wafers in a wafer carrier and put the carrier into the machine. Then you select the process you want to run and press start. When the process completes, you remove the wafer carrier from the tool. For development of SU8 resists we have a dedicated wet bench. The process is actually semi-manual as users normally do not have to fill chemicals into the submersion baths. Users have to manually move the wafer carrier from bath to bath though. You start by finding all the necessary equipment and place your substrates into the wafer carrier. Set the timer and start it as soon as you submerge your carrier into the first solvent bath. When the timer ends, transfer the carrier into the second solvent bath and restart the timer. When the timer ends again, transfer the carrier into the third bath, which is the rinsing bath. After rinsing the carrier and wafers properly, transfer the carrier to the drying station. Leave carrier and wafers to dry and clean the wet bench. This concludes the fourth lecture in the lithography TPT. Please continue to the next lecture which is a more detailed look into resists, substrates and pretreatment of substrates.